Welcome back everyone to Simplify Drawing and Painting. Today I'm very honoured to have American realist painter Susan Lyne joining me for an interview. I first became aware of Susan's work quite soon after I first started painting and I bought some of her videos which were massively helpful and became quite a significant influence on my work. Mm -hmm. Susan also has a Patreon channel and when I found out she offers one-to-one -one tuition I immediately signed up. So just like I have one-to-one -one students, I'm very fortunate to be one of her one-to-one -one students. For this reason, I thought I'd introduce her to you guys, just in case any of you weren't already aware of her work. So welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for agreeing. Oh, hi. Thanks, Alex. I'm so happy to be here with you. And I, gosh, I'm honored that I had anything, any inspiration towards you. Um, and I tell everybody about your YouTube channel. So. I think that you're doing a great thing. So I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. Yay. fantastic. And we're also very lucky because uh, Susan has agreed to do a short demo for this channel, which I know you guys are going to really enjoy. So you can all see how good she is. Um, oh. I'm about to play here. Well, first, let me show you how little the painting is. Yeah. So this painting is like an eight by six. So sometimes it's hard to tell in a video how yeah. big a painting is, but just so you can see how big it is to my head. <laughs> it's just a quick study, isn't it? It's like a Yeah, it was, I think it was 45 minutes. It says in the 45 minutes, I don't even, could be an hour, but I like to do timed paintings. It helps me get out of a rut or thinking about details, you know, it makes you simplify. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, as you say, you, you can watch the full thing on your Patreon channel, but we'll play it now. Oh, one hour. <laughs> so I just, I fast forwarded through this a little bit. And um, so I talked through the whole video pretty much. Very limited palette. And you go straight in for the docks. There's no kind of- Yeah, no, I try to, I try it as much as possible to put in my darks first because just trying to keep your darks thin and solid. And, you know, I used to not be so smart about that and try and paint my darks maybe on top of your lights. And then you're always struggling with getting dark enough, right? So, right, squinting the whole time. So while I'm doing the video, I, you know, it's kind of like always remembering myself and always telling other people to constantly squint and think about being like a computer. Like, how do you see the largest shape? How do you only do angles? How do you think in angles? And like you're posterizing, you know, that um, just thinking about angles and shapes and values and no details. And, and honestly, really trying to eliminate half tones. In the very beginning, if you can make something look. Um, it's fewer values. Real. Yeah, it's just a value study. And. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, because I know that when I paint life size and then I know that when I have all the time in the world to paint, like most of us, we slow down and we become very nitpicky and we go into details too fast. And so I'm like telling myself, like almost like trying to be a teacher to myself, this mantra, like, okay, simplify, use the biggest brush you possibly can. You know, what, how does one value go into another value? Don't think about outlining. You're not painting an eye, you're not painting a nose, you're painting the light hitting that subject or that object. You're not thinking about the def any sort of details inside the shadow. So probably my work, I overemphasize that or it's something that I love to do is to keep my shadows really mysterious. Um, and it's probably because of the lighting that I choose. I like to have dramatic lighting now, if you were to paint somebody outdoors or in a very light situation where the shadows aren't dark, well, then possibly, you know, it'd be a different way to approach painting. But, um, you know, I tend to love to see the drama. I don't know. I'm just attracted to it. And we all have these different things that we are kind of, it gives us goosebumps. So, mm. you know, starting off with your biggest brush, then going down to a medium sized brush, then go always, you know, kind of waiting to do your smallest brush at the very end and 
just playing that game. I, I know that sometimes when I'm working on a bigger painting and I say I'm painting something kind of over and over again and I'm getting frustrated, first the thing first thing I ask myself is, am I tired? Have I been painting too long? Because in general, I can concentrate for about 90 minutes before I need to like really take a good break. And then I mean like a long break. I just can't be 100%, you know, for hours, mm -hmm. you know, just, and so if I'm, you know, am I tired? Okay. Then also, am I using too small a brush? Mm -hmm. You know, am mm -hmm. I, you know, going into details? Am I, you know, there, and there is a point where am I painting something over and over and over again, then I need to just stop, maybe work on something else because I'm in a, this loop this kind of insane loop that I can't get out of it. So a lot of times I literally will turn my painting upside down and my reference upside down so that I'm tricking my brain to see something abstract. And to, because when we all think we know what lips look like or an eye looks like, but if I can get myself out of that kind of, you know, I guess, you know, what we all think it looks like and go, oh, I see an angle going up that far till it changes direction and goes that far till it goes down. And I see that this value goes into that value. And if I can just squint and compare and just really try and think of those larger shadow patterns, then when I turn it back side up, you know, it usually helps me then get out of that kind of cycle that I've, you know, gotten myself into. Um, and just also telling myself, go to a bigger brush. And sometimes I actually even say, like, if you're painting an apple, right, and you want to have fun and go, okay, I'm going to paint this apple in like 25 minutes or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Give yourself, I think of it like a game show, like, okay, you know, or like you're, you're an engineer, visualize it and go, okay, I can use this brush and I can paint this apple. And, you know, you really visualize yourself putting the brush stroke like this and like this and like that, you know, and you visualize it and you count the strokes and you go, okay, I can do that apple in eight strokes, or I, you know, I can do that nose in four strokes. And so it gets you into a different way of, of like thinking, because, you know, I know for myself, a lot of my issues is noodling. Like most people, mm -hmm. we literally touch the canvas with our brush too much. Um, somehow we're thinking things through with our brush on the canvas. And so we're like moving it around. And we think that if we keep doing this, that somehow it's going to get the shape. And it is, it's never worked. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like a universal thing where the more you touch your brush to the canvas and the more you fiddle or you put a brush stroke down, the more you touch that initial brush stroke, it disappears. The value gets lighter. The you know the, the colors get grayer, and so it's all about how can we, you know, edit. How can we put down strokes and leave them as much as possible? Because that's you know the ultimate goal is to, you know, put the right stroke in the right place with the right value, and that you know doesn't always happen. It's that would be a miracle, but it's. It's thinking like that. It's it's not allowing yourself to kind of get lazy thinking and just think that you can noodle something to be correct, you know? Or catch yourself doing it. Yeah, well, I know. And that's the whole, I know you and I, we both film ourselves so much painting yeah, yeah. And then you that see, don't you want to kill yourself? I mean, I just, exactly. and, and me too, because I will even edit or watch my husband Scott Burdick paint and he's great and he's fast. But yeah. sometimes even on his paintings, I'm like, Oh, why couldn't you have left it? Oh, you know, we do this where we just keep working on something. And if we had left it alone, it would have been just perfect. But in our minds, and sometimes it's like, I know that I can get caught up with, like if I have a model and, you know, you have a 25 minute time or something and I will just keep painting until the buzzer, right? when maybe I shouldn't, I remember seeing, sometimes I tell people this because I wish I could do it, is um, watching Richard Schmidt paint. And he was so good at regulating himself and just being a master, not only of every stroke, but he just, no matter if the model was up there or not up there, he was not playing by the, the rules. You know, 
if he put the perfect stroke down in 15 minutes, then he's done, you know? And so many times I would see him just be done, you know, and the model's still up there for two hours or whatever. And I think the rest of us, you know, kind of, you know, regular people, and I've seen myself do this, is that, oh, well, the model's still up there, so I should still keep painting. Yeah. Like, I just should still keep painting because the model's up there. And I have seen myself do it in videos and go, why did I do that? There's something about us following directions or, you know, whatever, when it would have been better of me just either taking a longer break or just realizing that less is more, you know, all these things that if we could only like, I don't know, be our own guardian angels and just tell us to stop. Someone take the brush away from me, you know? I'm inter interesting. I'm a bit more disciplined when I have more time. So like yeah. when, I'm, when I'm with a, when I'm painting like in a studio in a session with a model or like if mm -hmm. I'm doing a demo, mm -hmm. one tends to rush. But I've noticed when I've done stuff, when I've worked from photos and I've mm -hmm. actually got more time, even though I think because I'm conscious I've got more time and I've got this, huh. I could fiddle around as much as I want. I right. sometimes work really slowly, like literally paint sure. for half an hour. And yep. I think I've done that bit now. I'm going to leave it and think about it and come back and see if it needs more. And I have this process where I might work on a painting over like a whole week or day, but literally only doing an hour a day or it is quite. I it, it's, yeah. I'm I was saying, I think that's really smart. Yeah. I, I think I've got the time. So I'm like, and it, it's because I'm aware that, with a photo you may fiddle around with it for ages so yeah. i'm like really conscious of trying to do it but whenever i'm filming demos as you say i've always watched myself I'm like why am i painting that bit again you know yeah and and i mean even watching myself paint a demo or especially my husband you know especially if you know that there's like a demo for three hours the last half hour somehow we tell ourselves if our brush moves faster yeah. somehow magically an elf or somebody will take our brush and and it never works so um it's all you know thinking and learning about what our tendencies are and trying to kind of think about it because um you know some people might necessarily always maybe make their lights their, their darks too light some people might make the noses always too long. These are all these things that we know. And if we can just remember, okay, well, I always make my nose just a little bit too long. Okay, I'm just going to move it up, you know, a centimeter, you know, or maybe if I always make my darks too light, I'm just going to, while I'm mixing, because mm -hmm. something that I talk about a lot is making most of your decisions on your palette, not on the canvas. Like, your palette is where you make your decisions. You mix, you pre-mix, you choose what your lightest light and your darkest dark is. And so I'm always asking people too, to like, you know, not necessarily pre-mix everything, but give yourself some convenience values, mm -hmm. you know, like, especially um, in these small timed paintings, I, I always talk about that because there's, you do not want to be taking up three minutes to mix. You, you know, you have to have it all set. Feel it, think like a master chef, like you want to have everything prepared. So you're not like fiddling. And so I always make bigger piles than I think whenever I don't make like a good shadow pile, I always regret it. And I get so mad at myself for doing that same rookie mistake. Like, why can't I not learn that? I know I'm going to get really frustrated because I didn't make the shadow enough shadow, you know, value. Um, so I sympathize with people. I mean, and I understand all these things. Does painting doesn't come easy. You know, I, I think that probably the longer you paint, you expect more from yourself. So you are more self-critical. And then what happens is you switch from maybe somewhat of the technical stuff to, you know, making paint it, paintings interesting and unique and solely you, even though we're all inspired by other people, like I'm totally inspired by artists I see out there on Instagram. I'm inspired by master artists that are already past, but like, who am I? Like, who am I, you know, how do I take a little bit of all these things that, that make me excited and then do something different enough so that when my paintings on the wall, I talk to people a lot because people will ask me about entering competitions and stuff. And it's like, well, 
really put yourself in the viewers. Like when you walk into a gallery and there are 50, maybe even a hundred paintings on the wall, mm -hmm. what is going to make people go to your painting and not, you know, not be clouded and just have them gloss right over it. Um, so it's not just that art is fun, but do you even want to move people? You know, so we, that becomes the next step is like well, becoming, the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because that's the thing about, I've, I've done, just made a video on this in my, on my Patreon as well about, uh, basically about composition and it's about mm. design and it's, we as realist painters, we spend all our time studying how to get things to look lifelike. Right. And we, we, a lot of our education is on the house rather than, uh, certainly mine was, as opposed to what and why, you know, it's like, there's not as much just on a pure design level thinking about color harmony and and all of that but then subject matter it's like what is your painting about is it just about an aesthetic image is it just about colors and right. you know or is is there some sort of narrative or do you know what i mean and that oh. and i think that's what resonates with most people unless they're painters and they can appreciate the technique most mm -hmm. people don't, you know, your average person doesn't really admire the brush strokes to the same extent that we do. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and totally. There is yeah. different choices of colors. It's like, I really like that violet with that yellow, yeah. and, you know, or yeah. that, you know, that's a particular scene that I, resonates with me that I've seen before, or I don't know. So what, I mean, what, what are the things that really, what are you working towards now? What, what are the things that well, you really want to paint? I, well, you know, I don't, I totally go through phases. Um, there'll be times when all I want to do is portraits. There'll be times when a few, like a couple of years ago for about maybe two, three years, all I did was dry media because I had been kind of burnt out with just, you know, doing portraits and working from, you know, a lot of times we'll travel and we take photos on trips and then do paintings from that. And I wanted to experiment, you know, I wanted to like, I've always loved drawing. And I remember early on seeing drawings from Richard Schmidt and seeing drawings from Nikolai Feshin and, you know, even Sargent and, and Russians and stuff. And just being so, I guess, gravitated towards this dry medium. And, but the thing is, is that maybe when you go to art school or you start with galleries, there's always this little chatter about how drawings cannot be as important and or maybe you can't get as much money so I think what happens is a lot of artists shy away from it and um I just what I just sometimes you know when you have rules I just I just don't play well like that so I'm like no I'm gonna do drawings and I'm gonna make people like them and all this stuff and and I also love Alphonse Mucha so having that design element and having you know the real and the made up and Clint I mean all of these artists just elevated you know all of this stuff so much and so how do then I move towards with that and so you know first I learned about painting with dry medium and I learned about that primarily through Richard Schmidt and some other artists. There was a, a, a Ramon Kelly was another artist I heard of years and years ago who, who used like watercolor acrylic and pastel together. But thinking about charcoal or pastel, but using like a brush and also um, using like, yeah, like acetone and or water to create effects and using different surfaces. So some are porous like paper and then others are slick like even gessoed board or hot press watercolor board or all kinds of different boards that the dry media will be affected by, you know? And so I love that. And there's certain shows that I'm in that, um, you know, it's like when you go to the show, there might be like hundreds of paintings and there might be four drawings or four things mm -hmm. on paper. And you know, it's because artists, you know, can't right. get as much money for it yeah, or yeah. something. And so, I don't know, it, it, it like, I made me so, I was like, I wanna bring drawings back. So for a few years, all I did was that. And then of course you do that for a while and then you wanna change over and do something else. And there was a while there that all I wanted to do was figures. 
I, you know, and that happens a lot when you get a really good figure model. You know, right. when you get one figure model that is so good that you just want to like use them until they move away and like leave you forever. You're like, no, I need to hire you all the time. And so, you know, going through figure models then going through still life stage. Um, right now, m my interest is kind of figures, but maybe in scenes, not so much interiors, but similar to interiors where I'm trying to think of, you know, Mancini did that amazing. You know, every artist we love from like a hundred years ago would have these commissions of people in chairs or you'd have rooms behind them. But I also love it. I love kind of theatrical stuff. So I love thinking about a model, but not maybe being the main focus where the model is incorporated with a still life or maybe, you know, it's just a scene in a room, but there's lots of storytelling. So objects that you can have talk about and they lead you in the, in the face of the model. In fact, I'm going to have a photo shoot coming up next week where I, you know, so I think about this for weeks and I think about things I have already, like still life objects, props, mm. but then I'm also thinking about maybe what stuff my friends have, or maybe stuff that I need to go buy you know, maybe it is flowers, maybe it is food, maybe it is um, even like, I mean, I'm so into this idea of plaster casts, where I have all these different ideas of white on white on white with my model. And how will I play with her and using masks and different faces? So we'll see. And so when I go into a photo shoot like that, my husband and I will do it together. And usually I go into it with like almost like a vision board or some ideas mm -hmm. thinking maybe I'll even have like a, a painting from the past that I like the idea of lighting. And so I'll set it up in my studio. Like you see, like here, you know, mm -hmm. is, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff like on a table. Right. And so there's plaster casts, there's like stuffed animals, there's books, there's all kinds of things. And so what I, and I have tables and chairs and, and so what I have to think of is, okay, I have to have a foreground, middle ground and background. So I think about stuff that can be in front of the model. I think, is she going to be standing? Is she going to be sitting? She could even be lying down, you know? And then I have to think about, well, what is behind her going to look? Is it going to be totally simple or is there going to be like plants or is there going to be a big mirror or, you know, so I envision it a lot. And then I, I set up at least one idea, one thing. And, you know, usually every time I get into a photo shoot, we give ourselves two hours. Um, you kind of play the beginning of a photo shoot. The model's awkward. We're kind of like, what's the right lighting and then you just keep taking photos and you keep taking photos and you ask her to do micro changes and you you walk around so I always ask tell people you know a lot of times stay in one spot so Scott will usually stay in one spot with a with a tripod and then we'll have the model figure out a simple pose and then we'll have the model slightly start moving hands or head it more, most likely you'll get better photos that way. Now for me, then what I get to do is be the groving photographer. So I do the profiles and I, you know, will go to the light side of the model and I'll go to the dark side of the model. And then that way we really get everything possible before we change. Because what I find a lot of times, especially when people show me photographs, because they'll say, well, what do you think of these photos? Should I do a painting of it? A lot of times what's happening is, first of all, it's, it's nerve wracking and stressful to do a photo shoot, especially if it's just one on one, because usually the artist is feeling weird and like guilty. And you're like, are you having fun? Do you, uh? And so you rush, you mm -hmm. rush and you take, you don't take enough time. You don't take enough time to adjust lighting. You don't take enough time to do a thousand photos, 1500 photos. And so what happens is you'd maybe take 20 minutes to half hour and you're like, oh, okay, I'm done. You don't seem to, you seem to be tired. All right, let's go. And, and we tell the model up front, you know, it's going to be two hours. We're going to take breaks. And also just keep showing the model your photos. If the model sees how beautiful they are, 
and you show them. So, I mean, honestly, it's like magic. They then feel like they're not looking stupid. And then they, you know, even kind of play it up a little more and you, and you tell them how great they look. And I always give all the photos to my models anyways. Yeah. I know this is kind of going into a photo shoot, I think, but it's, it's important when you are trying to be your own, get your own ideas, you know, is that so many people are intimidated to hire models, set up models, or even set up still lifes and stuff. So my suggestion is, first, if you really want to set up a good still life, my first thing is just do tiny little simple ones. Mm. You know, one object, a little vase flowers, nothing too big. Do lots and lots of little like eight by tens, simple still lifes and always have, I mean, a suggestion is always have a white and always have a dark. Too many times people will show me still lifes and everything will be dark or there'll be no contrast at all or they'll go to a grocery store and buy those flowers and they're all dark. And so I'm always like, have a white base, choose a, a darker background. So you have contrast, have a middle value plane, you know, think about these things so that when you're trying to think about value, you have a white and a dark that you can play off of. And so don't just have everything be on the light side with no darks and don't have everything be on the dark side with no lights. And then the second thing is set up a big dining room table or a big table in your studio and literally just, just start being like a crazy person and get vases and flowers and whatever's interests you. And you just make it larger than you possibly think. Then you crop. Mm -hmm. Then you just go in either with one of those little, you know, paper squares or your hands and you just move around and you put a light source and always choose one light source. So if you have lights from above, figure out how you can block those off or turn them off have one light source and you take a good time and you literally look at it from sitting, look at it from standing and you then just move around and then crop in and do a little nine by 12. Because what happens is a lot of times people don't anchor paintings off of the edges. So even if they're doing a portrait, there's like, it's just head and like space. Mm -hmm. So you don't need objects to anchor a portrait, but you need shape and value so those so that's a portrait but like say a still life what happens is people usually have very bottom heavy still lives and mm -hmm. then it's just like a halo around some flowers or some objects if you go in and you crop you're always going to have something going off there's and um and thinking about how do you abstract like half of it you mm -hmm. know i think you and i were talking about like we try so hard when we're realist artists to learn how to create something and make it look real. And then there has to come a point when we have to deprogram ourselves because I know this happens to me too. I get too literal. You know, you have a photo or you have somebody in front of you and the background or the shirt becomes too literal. And what that word is synonymous or equates to is boring. You know, the reason why you do art is to create a new world, to create a new vision. So you know, I learned from a lot of artists is to edit. So how do you literally take away half the information? And so, you know, if you have a huge bunch of junk on a table and you crop in, well, some of it's not going to make sense because maybe half of an object is literally going off the side. Well, you don't paint that literal so that the viewer goes, oh, wait, what's that hand coming in? No, it's either a value or a shape or a palette stroke or you as an artist edit it out and you create it yourself. It's all about how do you literally, you know, I think maybe you and I probably and the people that we like, we like realism and we like um, kind of abstraction all in the same painting. You know, it's like, we don't want all of realism. So, but what's the balance? Like, how do you mm -hmm. give and take, you know, and, and so when you give yourself permission to say, you know what, half of this junk, half of these notes, half of this stuff in here, I'm literally going to paint through and then just give it a value or a beautiful, you know, kind of like a, like a, like a music, music stroke, like stroke, 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 stroke. And then 
you allow half of it just to be a dance and then half of it to be real, that's when people like their heart rates go up a little bit when they see mm. it and your heart rate goes up when you paint it. Yeah. You need to view, you need to direct the viewer's attention, don't you? So when everything's yeah. full focus, it's kind right. of not, not, you know, the viewer doesn't know where to look. It can, yeah. I think it can be done. So sure. you know, I'm thinking of Vermeer or someone like that, where everything is painted in ultra detail, but the values are so spot on. Right. That, the vote you know where to but you know he definitely edited he yeah, definitely yeah. changed stuff you know it did yeah. not look exactly like that so we don't even know mm. what he simplified yeah know? yeah yeah no exactly exactly but yeah it just seems i don't know what what gets lost and what i think mm -hmm. the, the more um but it is the, the more experience i get it's all about learning what to leave out yeah yeah like we were mm -hmm. saying before about you know painting too much we're just just, yeah yeah leaving things out interesting interesting so so i was gonna say um that that so from your videos the thing you were mentioning colors before and pre-mixing colors mm -hmm. and that was one of the things i really got early on from you um the videos i've got of yours are, are sketching the figure in oils and actually it's one of scott's the basics of color and it was where I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd used the Zorn palette before, but it was where you, because in, in um, figure sketching all, you use, you use a limited palette of, um, uh, I think it was Ultramarine uh, and Alizarin and yeah, was it Yellow Ochre or you might have used a, a cat. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it changed. So, you know, a lot of times I would use permanent rose because it is such a very pretty pink and um and then sometimes i would play with doing like permanent rose maybe even cobalt blue but all, maybe ultramarine blue and like a yellow and i my fun color that i always like to add when i'm doing figures is cat orange and i and i it's because it's such a pretty color to like mix ochres with that like for the shadows but you know whenever you are doing like little bits of like fingers or toes or anything or like an ear you know wherever the skin's very thin and you see that warmth coming through in a figure or like even like you know like a, a nipple on a woman's chest i never like to go dark so i always want to use that little bit of that cad orange and with white is the perfect like pink it really is it, it just makes that perfect pink in general it's funny when i do portraits i think i've always gravitated towards a lot of times full value you know having strong shadows and strong and clean lights but when I do figures, it's almost like I don't like that lighting or that kind. I, I like to go high key. So when I say high key, I mean that my values are accordion. So my darks don't get darker than like a six or seven and my lights come in. So my lights have more color and my shadows are lighter. And so it's almost like more of a pastel. To me, when I paint the figure, that's how I see it. I think of a figure as especially a nude figure to me when it's, if it's painted full value, almost seems garish. That's just me. You know, I'm sure people can do it really beautifully, but I love having those softer, more muted, almost high key values. Um, so I, you know, if you're going to paint a Caucasian, I love to have cools like greens or baby blues or neutral cools behind them so that the flesh looks like even more rosy um but uh so yeah so but you were asking about like limited palette so i'm always trying to think okay you know first of all the two major things i know i always need is a like a brown and a blue and when i mean brown i mean just like a neutral so it's a warm and a cool and um so I like to have more of a neutral brown because it's just such a, a basic home color. And it, you know, it's just basic. It's almost like anything that's life. It could be nature, like outdoors. It can be figure, portrait, even flowers. Just having a warm and a cool, you can do so much. And I, and I know that we've learned so much from uh, John Singer Sargent because if you look at his work, especially his earlier work, 
It literally is just brown and blue. And it's the how many variations, how does he use transparency and opaque and how does he cool and warm? And you don't really need much more because for some reason our eyes fill it in, you mm. know, it's, I, it's. I think that was the, I, I mean, I, that's the first time I saw that palette was Scott's video, the basics of color. Uh, both these videos are available on your website, aren't they? All your videos and you made. And they're, yeah, they're available on our website and we have them on yeah. Patreon. Yeah. So, so yeah, I saw um, that was the one and using that palette. So that um, what was he using burnt sienna or transparent oxide red? I can't remember. He was was using warm, transparent oxide red because yeah, warm, you can, because burnt it. sienna is definitely, there's so many different kinds of burnt siennas. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, when you get a different brand and, and it has a lot of like, minerals and binders you know it's a mixture so it's this earth color so it just depends on which brand you use and in all honesty a burnt sienna you know every color that comes out of a tube has an inherent value mm. so a burnt sienna probably doesn't go any darker than an eight but yeah, yeah. a transparent oxide red can literally go dark i mean it's very very you know dark if you see it coming out of the tube and then what you do is you play with the value by how transparent you want yeah. it to be right and so and then you can even put every time you add white to something so i'm always trying to reinforce to people that white is a cool so every time you add white to anything yeah. it cools it so, you know, sometimes when people want to paint sun or they want to, you know, paint their children at the beach, I really suggest using a warm white or mixing your white with a little bit of this warm yellow so that you never go back into that cool white mm. to lighten your values. You're always, remember the sun, your, your lights are going to become richer. They're actually going to become almost darker. You know, it's like they have more saturation. Um, so that's just something as a you know thing to remind yourself. Mm. So do you still use that? I mean, I it's interesting because after seeing that, I teach that palette. That's how I introduce. Um, I learned so much. I think that palette was the first thing that really got me to understand color temperature. So people were always like, oh, warm and cool colors. And it was like, what does that mean? Red's warm, right. blue's cool. But understanding that and how you can basically, it's kind of a grizz eye in two cut in sure. with warms and cools and it looks like it's in color um and yeah so that's i've been but i've been i've been using it and any of my viewers who's watching my previous videos will have seen some of my videos done with that palette so do you still how often do you still use that palette i use brown and blue a lot when i am working from life so if i have there's a model and um we don't have a lot of time i'm really so mindset of simplifying to my time limit too. So if I have a model for two hours, if I have a model for three hours, you know, I paint smaller, I paint a simpler and I paint probably in brown and blue, you know? So, cause I'm just, there's too much to think about. I'm always amazed. I, I mean, sometimes like I just taught a workshop and I had somebody who literally I'm teaching and telling people to paint, you know, 12 by 16 life size, you know, and she wanted to come in with like literally like a 30 by 40 because people are programmed to think that bigger is better, bigger is more ambitious. Like, you know, they want to um, push themselves, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and I'm always trying to emphasize, you know, don't set yourself up for failure because if you don't have the time, if you don't, if you're not understanding, you know, how, how much energy and how much paint you need to fill up this size canvas, you're just going to be frustrated and then make excuses, you know, that somehow it's not your fault where it is because you chose to do that. So I'm, so whenever, if I'm painting for an hour, you see, it's like a six by eight, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm pay, have a little bit longer, you know, nine by 12, maybe, or I rarely, when I paint from life, especially like a portrait and you have anywhere between two and a half, sometimes four hours, but with breaks, I like to paint my heads a little bit smaller because then I don't have to put so much detail in. That's just me. You know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm thinking about how much can I get done and not rush. And also just when I, because people ask me a lot of times, like if you're doing something from life, 
and it's left, right? It's kind of left as a study or what maybe what we might call a vignette. So mm. where there's just, you know, it's like left brush strokes that you see to create movement. Um, people will say, well, how would you finish this? And when people ask me that, I go, gosh, what do you, what are you asking? You know, like, do you want every part of the canvas mm. licked? Do you want, does everything have to be spelled out for you? Because I love seeing almost deconstructed paintings. I love having part of it unfinished. So that's what I'm telling myself when I'm painting from life is that don't overdo it. Don't put more than you need. Don't overspice it, you know, kind of thing. And so there's always that balance. And, and when you're done and the brush is, you know, and the model's gone and somebody says, well, how would you finish this in your studio? I go, well, this is what it is. This mm -hmm. is what I did at this time. Now, I'm not going to say I never touch a painting afterwards, but usually what I do, if I know the painting is going okay, right? I'm feeling it. We always have that like one in a hundred that we're like, okay, maybe this one might work. I take photos or something. Usually what I leave for working on later is possibly a teeniest bit, maybe in the hair, just to mm -hmm. like, you know, transfer to the background and jewelry. Okay. So yeah. I never try and paint jewelry while there are yeah. models up there. So, you know, because in general, you want jewelry to be painted like it's almost like a, a shooting star. You know, I hate it when jewelry is over painted, over modeled because it looks illustrative and childlike in a way. So you want jewelry to look like it's an impression and it's not. Yeah, so yeah. I tend to want to do that from a photo so I can really think about it and do those steps about visualizing. Okay, can I do this earring in three strokes? You know, that so type of stuff. It, sometimes it takes thought, like say- Well, and sometimes you have to paint it over and over yeah, and over. Or, or, or say the pattern on the on, on oh, your yeah. uh, blouse yeah. that you're wearing. It's like, okay, I exactly. want to paint that quickly and exactly. make it look. And I need to think about that because it's like a totally. puzzle I need to solve rather than I'm not going to just do it in the, right, in the right. space of time. Another thing, do you find with paintings that, that it's like, if you do a, something that looks sketchy, and the whole thing is kind of sketchy. It works and it looks finished. Mm -hmm. And then if you work up a particular area into a bit more finish and resolve, suddenly the other bits look sketchy. And sure. then you need to kind of work the whole thing up into to the, to sort of a, a, a higher Totally, and that's why painting is hard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my paintings, you know, it's like I do so much overpainting. Yeah. I'm constantly thinking that I'm working things out and getting them right. And then I look back at them and I go, wow, okay. Yeah. Like maybe I overdid it. Maybe yeah. I gave too much information. And so a lot of it is just this like give and take and judging yourself and questioning like, and trying to see things new. So looking at things upside down, people love to look at things in a mirror a lot of times what I love to do and show people is when I'm critiquing their work is that a great thing that people can do is like, they'll send me their reference and their painting, right? And the first thing I see is I see it on my phone. So you see in these tiny little boxes and they're literally right next to each other. So that's a perfect way to be your own teacher. What stands out? What's the first thing? And then also it's really great if people take the time to take a picture of your painting and put it into your computer if you have photoshop or not any mm -hmm. sort of program or literally just putting them on your monitor right next to each other seeing them the way other people will see them it's like wow it does i do see it and everybody says the same thing i see it now where i didn't see it mm -hmm. in my studio it's just do we take the time to do it you know mm. that's it i suppose it's that slow it's so hard isn't it i mean so <laughs> much of when you do a good when you do a good thing in a short space of time, so much luck involved. It, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's experience. I think Yeah. we just, you know, our, our, our low gets higher and higher, you know, we yeah. can still bomb out, but I also find too, that so much of me and my frustration level has to do with, am I fed? You know, am I tired? Blah, blah, blah. Am I inspired? But am I being patient? Mm. You know, so I, go, I always have these intentions, you know, it happens a lot when I'm painting in a group because you get group dynamics. Mm -hmm. Some people paint fast, some people's energies, you know, the models, this, the lighting's this, you don't like your spot, blah, blah, blah. 
But if you can just sit and go, okay, every stroke, I'm just going to enjoy the experience. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to like be upset. This isn't, I'm not going to put a frame on this. Mm. I'm not going to put pressure on myself. The more that you can just love the experience of play and being, you know, just loving the mixing and just patience. I mean, that word is such a key, a golden key that if I know that when I keep that word patience in my mind and I keep breathing, things turn out better then when I allow myself to get frustrated and all the thoughts going through my head about negativity and hating everybody around me and, you know, just not wanting to be there and just, you know, it's, so it's a lot of it is mindset and can yeah. you stay patient? Yeah. So I've always said that it's a meditation painting. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. You know, it's uh, yeah. Like that you, 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 you know, the little voice in your head, when because you always make mistakes when you're painting you just correct them sure and exactly. it's how much how much kind of how much attachment there is to the mistakes totally. sometimes it turns into like oh this is a disaster i'm you know and then you just keep and it's like the whole painting the experience of painting can become completely unpleasant as opposed to <laughs> if if you exactly. can make the same mistake and not yeah. judge it and then the strange yeah. thing is at the end of the experience you may come away from that painting feeling oh, this is rubbish, and then look at it, and actually it's not so bad, and then the feeling, you know, the feeling that you think you've done an amazing painting because you you're, you felt good while you were doing it, and actually when you hold the two things next to each other, it's kind of like they may or may not be better or worse. Do you, do you see what I mean? Often well, often the one when you feel better about it, you produce better well, results. And sometimes, be we, mistakes. <laughs> sometimes we don't even know. Yeah. You know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like I mean sometimes like I'll look at my husband's work yeah. and there's certain paintings like I don't love everything he does I mean I'm yeah. honest yeah. about it yeah and yeah, yeah. and he'll really like a painting because a lot of times there's an attachment to it either it was yeah. the experience or maybe even just one aspect of that painting it was maybe he hadn't done that before or he liked how this came yeah. out but in my mind I'm like maybe it's not my cup of tea or something so that's why art is, you know, you just need one person to buy it out of like yeah. how many billion of people there are in the world, you know? So you just, you know, it's a good thing not to make every single painting look exactly the same. It's, mm. it's a good thing to kind of experiment and you have great paintings that like 50 people want to buy. And then there's other paintings that literally just the right person and they're so happy. And, you know, so well, it I might take five years to sell. I think you've got to make mistakes in order to learn as well. You've got to do things that if you want to, like you were saying, you wanted to experiment, you're going to have to do stuff that's kind of, that yeah. you haven't done before and that you, you will fail. Exactly. And, and in order to, to solve problems, do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I've over the pandemic, I've spent a lot more time landscape painting mm -hmm. um, than I did before ever, ever before and learned so much stuff and painted things that I wouldn't dare painting like I always used to struggle with skies and clouds and things like that and uh, I thought right I'm just gonna sit there and did loads of really bad cloud things sure. for ages and ages it's like literally I haven't had any work to put in, in into anything because I've done so many yeah. bad paintings in the last but I'm kind of getting there now I think I've done some good clouds recently do you know well, what I mean yeah. so I think you've got to do that and I think maybe yeah. a lot of artists don't go out of their comfort zones well, it's because people want to make money. Um, and yeah. so mm -hmm. even when I tutor people who are trying so hard to get into, you know, galleries and stuff, it's this desperation kind of thing because they want, they start off, they try to paint things that they've seen already. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we all do it. So there's no judgment there. I mean, but the pandemic has, I think, shifted everything. I, I know that I actually have lost a lot of over as I get older and older, it comes mm. with age. You lose this sort of needy ambition of like somehow doing or being something that you know. But even this pandemic, right? Like you said, everything shifted. I mean, shows or what you want to paint or how much you want to produce, and just enjoying what you do is so much more important. It always, you know, than mm. like impressing people or you know having so many paintings be out there. It's um it's a it's a time for us all to kind of reevaluate like 
being an artist is a pretty fantastic job. Mm. And but it's also a head game because yeah. there's a lot of self-doubt, but then there's yeah. like comparison, yeah. but we're also alone, you know? So we, yeah. maybe our yeah. thoughts get crazy, <laughs> you know? So I think, like, well, I think it's the same for anyone who does anything they're passionate about. Right. Um, obviously so much of your ego or whatever, or mm-hmm. that's tied up in it, your self-esteem. Yeah. Um, and you get knocked back when you get knocked back it feels really personal um and it's challenging you know there's obviously there's so many other things that you have to sacrifice like compared to not not you know like the normal nine to five bill paying true um, yeah you, know you have mean? to that, be good that, about yeah you have to be good about saving money and yeah. budgeting yourself yeah so scott and i will never do anything you know, everything we have to have cash. We just do. Like, I think it's both of our families. We're so different about money, but we both have come to the exact same um, idea that we cannot live on credit. We cannot live having things hanging over us. So anything we do, like any trips, anything we buy, like cars or anything we do has to be bought outright, outright. So that we never have to think of, in fact, the only overhead I personally have is this studio. Mm. Um, So, you know, we we moved from Chicago to a very kind of rural area in North Carolina because we knew that there's just no way that we want to deal with month to month, you know, Mm. bills or things that we always have to like, maybe take commissions or paint things that we don't want. So we moved to a less expensive area and, you know, so that we didn't have to have that. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, as you say, it's, it's amazing, but I think of anything, if you were going to kind of commit to a sport or something right. that you're passionate about, yeah. Um, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to, well, everyone has to work really hard anyway, whatever they do, okay. forced to, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not, um, I don't know. I mean, for, for me personally, I started painting quite late. You know, I'd already, I wanted, I wanted to, we'll talk about this in a minute because it's, it's going to come up because I'm going to ask you about your education and stuff like that. But but I started painting quite late, so I'd already kind of started a career doing something completely different. And then I was like, right, I'm going to give this up, and I'm going to do what I always wanted to do. And um, it that that's you know that that and I thought I'd be fulfilled. You know, I said, right, I'm going to be an artist, and it's going to fulfill me because this is what I've always wanted to do. But it it has fulfilled me. But at the same time, it's brought up every other area of my life, and and do you know what I mean all you know it's forced me to deal with all sorts of stuff and I think that's the same for anyone doing something that they're passionate about really something that really means something to them do you know what I mean yeah well we're Um, literally selling our imagination yeah yeah not only our imagination but our ability to technically execute it and so it is there's a lot of different layers like you say <laughs> and as I say and I think if you're painting the stuff that really matters to you or you're doing what really mm-hmm. matters to you like this is what I really want to do rather than just being commercial because you mm-hmm. could just think oh people like this and I'm going to do this yeah. and then it becomes a job and it's not the same yeah thing. no and it takes that there's tons of artists that are really good at you know producing and being productive and making lots of money and I just think that early on it knew that we couldn't do that we couldn't be art directed we couldn't you know i think i was uh, like did you do because i felt I, I i always thought i would do portrait commissions and it's why well um and then... i've done a few and i'm not against them at all yeah. but um i just it's never been something that you know has been in my world i mean i have done a few and they were mainly for friends um, Scott did a bunch early on, yeah. but you know, it was very frustrating for him because he usually likes to paint relatively, you know, thick and juicy and, and 
you know, a lot of the people would always want him to smooth everything out and yeah. I'm, you know, change it and have really silly, you know, kind of poses. So in general, in the future or whenever, if people want commissions, they kind of have to want a painting similar to what we do. Mm. And then anytime we do that now, it's kind of like, well, we'll do the painting, but you have no obligation to buy it. You know, it's like, we have to do it for ourselves. And if you like yeah. it, great. And if you don't like it, there's no obligation, you know? So I think I've done that. I'm, I'm a bit more like that. You don't take deposits then? No. Yeah, no. I, that's the same now. I used to. I used to always like, right, because that's all you're supposed to do is a portrait painting. But now I'm like, no, I'm not going to take a deposit. I'm just going to, if you don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the way. But yeah, I, that is, that's one of the things. I, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a portrait. The guy who taught me to paint was a portrait painter. And I was like, oh, okay, well, he does. But faces then I, are I, my I favorite thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... What was I going to say? So speaking about becoming an artist and like, let's go back to when you decided to become a painter. What what was it that made you? Well, I mean, I was in high school and I uh, saw a program on Georgia O'Keeffe and pro and it, I love I mean, her work is beautiful and colorful, but it was uh, her lifestyle. So I don't know if people in, in England are that familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe, but in the United States, there's just not that many women artists that are famous. So Georgia O'Keeffe is just one of those that PBS, which is our, you know, TV stations that do like kind of artsy stuff. And, you know, that's probably the only woman that they've ever profiled that, and she had such a life, you know? And so that's what like attracted me was like having that artist life and that you know just being who you are and just being so free and exotic and kind of thing and so um but I went to an illustration or yeah. advertising school in Chicago so, my dad went to the American Academy of Art American Academy of Art was just an associate's degree type of school you didn't need any grades or anything to get in I mean honestly I didn't even I hadn't really even done art before wow. I had taken dabbled in a uh, a weekend class at the Art Institute, but it was just stupid. They don't teach you anything. And so I didn't have any, even anything to show them, but, mm. but it, you, so it was a tech. How much did you draw as a kid? Were you like, into no, I, I technically not very gifted at drawing at all. Yeah, no. Like I, my dad went to the Art Institute in the fifties. Yeah. So I knew growing up that he had had this failed dream of being an artist. Okay. And I had seen a couple things in photographs but um so that was always in the back of my mind I knew that and I remember him saying stuff that real artists carry sketchbooks and real artists do this and real artists do that and so whenever I would try and sketch in a sketchbook with pencil I hated it and so that equated to me being a loser and you know just not wanting to be an artist and what I did find over time though was that kind of like we all learn differently I found that I just didn't learn art that way. I'm not a yeah. linear person. I, I, I don't do well with trying to sketch or do line. And it took me until my mid to late thirties that to even start to experiment with dry medium to like go, oh, I'm not a line person. I'm a, I'm a mass person. Yeah. I like mass. I like shape and value. Whereas somebody else might be so good at sketching or linear stuff, I just thought I was stupid and, and not talented. So sometimes we just have to really find how like we learn, you know, are you good at visual or audio or, you know, however tactile, but um, so, but no, I went to the American Academy of Art, which was a associate's degree and it was just art. They didn't teach anything else. So um, I mean, and you said it was illustration you did or? yeah it was primarily an illustration advertising school yeah. and um but you know magazine illustration and advertising was kind of stopping because computer stuff was coming yeah. in when i started they had a very they did have a fine art you know class and stuff i i say that you know i was lucky enough to to have the art the american academy near and it was realistic but I mean, I don't 
I didn't learn as much as some of these other schools that were really strict and really gave you guidelines and mm. really had hands on. I never once had a teacher really give me that much instruction. It was, and I never had a teacher actually touch my work in any way, never, you know? So it was, um, but I met Scott early on. I mean, I met Scott when I was 19. Mm. And so being around him and all the artists that he hung around was what really allowed me to become an artist because it showed that people could make a living at it, which seemed like a miracle. And, um, but in a way it was like a double-edged sword. So I met him when I literally just began painting, like literally, but then I was so incredibly intimidated because I felt like I had no talent. I was going to go into advertising. Mm. So when you're around people like Richard Schmidt and Scott, and Nancy and Rose and Dan Gerhardt and all these people, you then put yourself in the secondary role of like, I'm going to be the girlfriend, you know, and I'm going to be the of girlfriend course. who just hangs on and, and never showed anybody anything. And people would be polite, of course, and want to say, Oh, I'd love to see your work. And it'd be like, Oh God, no, no, you know? And so I really feel like I identify with every single person who knows what it's like to like, just be so scared to show their work. Whereas Scott, it came more easier to him. Mm. He just has better draftsman skills. He maybe being a guy, he had more confidence. Like he has no problem with putting himself out there. And it was completely opposite for me. So, you know, even though I went to that school, I think I stunted myself because I wasn't learning or growing with people my same level. Mm. I immediately was like with other people who were so good that I just clammed up. Um, but, you know, luckily I did meet him because honestly, being around all those people, you realize, first of all, how hard they worked. I mean, I had no idea what work ethic was. I literally did not know what work ethic was until I met Scott and all those people. I was probably a slacker. You know, I, I just didn't realize I lived at home. I didn't have to work. You know, I didn't have to, I didn't have a job. So, you know, they would paint all day. They would paint three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and they would paint three hours at night. And when I witnessed that, so it was like, witnessing people work so hard and be so passionate and just every day, seven days a week and feeding off of each other. That was what I realized. Oh, I get it. And it took me a long time to actually be able to do that because when you have a lot of self doubt, you, you're always just like thinking it's not worth it. Well, it's not worth it for me to put all that time and energy in it because it's not going to go anywhere. So yeah. So how long did it take? So you were, how long were you at the American? Uh, I was at the American Academy for about three years, sort of two years kind of full-time. And I think yeah. one year uh, part-time. But what, when did you start the palette and chisel? Well, I, so when I met Scott, um, I was just starting oil painting and the palette and chisel is just two miles from yeah. the school. And so everybody knew about it. Like teachers talked about it. Everybody was like, all the famous artists go there. And I had had a girl who was in my oil painting class. She was posing there. And so I was like, oh my God, how do you get to do that? Like, oh, I was like, oh, that's just amazing. And so she told me, she says, why don't you show up one day while I'm posing and I'll introduce you. And well, I tell this story so much because this is how, how I met Scott was that when I showed up one day, you know, I was with my parents. It was really kind of wholesome and I was so scared. And I had actually had my, my dad had bought a painting of Scott's from an auction and stuff. So when I first met him, I was able to say, oh my gosh, I have one of your paintings. And he literally says, well, you should pose for us. And I was like, ah! I mean, I literally, I think I started to scream. And so I was like, okay. And so that's kind of how it all started was I started to pose at the palette and chisel and Scott and I started to date because we realized we lived so close to each other. And, but I probably started painting. Is that, there's maybe, a painting of you by Richard Schmidt, isn't there? As in that's that exactly that time. He painted yeah. me, I was only 19, but he painted me, I look like I'm in my thirties, you know, it made me look very sophisticated and yeah, I was yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. I was not, I was, I think I had braces. I mean, I literally looked 19 at the time, you know? And um, so, but 
I did become a member maybe six to eight months later. But you know, the sad thing is, is that maybe soon after that, like Richard and Nancy and Rose and Dan, they literally had all moved away. So I started to, you know, go to the Paladin Shizzle um, with Scott and stuff, but then there was like nobody great anymore. They had all moved. And, um, and then we, I moved from Chicago to North Carolina when I was 26. So we painted, you know, my early twenties to the Paladin Shizzle, but I don't know, maybe your viewers might have, you know, art clubs are interesting. I, I give a lot of advice to people who are in art clubs because you know, there's always a dynamic and it's like, yeah. we found, we actually found that we had to stop going to the Palette and Chisel because people never wanted to like change. They were always really stubborn. Everybody was jealous of different people. And it became like a negativity thing to where you're like, well, okay, we're just going to then do stuff in our apartment. You know, we're not going to go to the Palette and Chisel anymore. Um, you know, so that's how that went. But then we moved down here and had to start all over, you know, just kind of didn't know anybody, didn't have any models and just little by little by little meeting people, word of mouth, finding models in grocery stores, you know, a, a local little framer, you know, would help us get models. And then I didn't know any other local people for probably four or five years. And then starting to have people over to draw and, you know, so slowly you build your own art community, you know, to mm -hmm. where like-minded like energy people you know we all gravitate towards the same thing so you find so your there, do you have an art group there in South Carolina? well I have friends and there are a little bit of art communities but you know like I have this studio and I've had a bigger studio where I would yeah. have figure models and stuff and we'd invite people but you know they had to do what we wanted to do like I yeah. wasn't going to like this was not like, this was my studio inviting you over. And so what, when you go to an art club, like a pal and chisel, there's like 20 people's opinions. Well, and but there's I'm always like, the hey. people that run it. There's always like an alpha. Who kind exactly. Of <laughs> so it's like, you want to be the alpha, you know? Yeah, so yeah. It was, to me, I'm like, okay, then I become the alpha. And yeah. if you like the models I choose, if you like the music I listen to, the lighting, if you oh, like yeah. my energy, then great, you're invited. If you don't like my energy, then you know have a great life. But that's how that's how you have to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Art groups. So yeah, I'm I yeah I'm surprised. So um, I assumed that you because it occurs it's always appeared to me that American art schools or certainly particular art schools were actually a lot better or there was more training. It sounds like you were very lucky to find Richard Schmidt at the Parrot. Uh, exactly. Pallet and Chisel. Exactly. No, it yeah. was like amazing timing. My life yeah. changed drastically, drastically when I was 19. So, and I just happened to live near, like in an urban city. Mm. I mean, people who live in rural areas, people who live for sure. I mean, when I went to like, like we were talking about like realism now, Sure, like it became a lot of abstract in the 50s in the United States. There was yeah. still realism, but more illustrative. But well, Western Western yeah. art in the US always stayed. Because so, I, I think like the Art Students League in New York, for instance, has, mm -hmm. they were kind of a mixed bag if you look, but they always had like really solid, I'm thinking. Yeah, like, in the 70s, level. 60s and 70s, they had a whole yeah. bunch of like or, artists or, like where you know Tony Pro and and um and Jeremy Lipkin they did they they studied illustration didn't they in LA I don't know which university I think they all so I'm not the same I, course. I, I yeah I'm like, not exactly sure I think they went to a arts and design yeah. kind of college um but that how kind of did happen maybe in the 90s you yeah. know it was a little bit of a wasteland in the 70s and 80s I mean, Richard always stayed doing his work, yeah. but he sold well, he in the Western. He went to the Art Academy of Chicago as well, didn't he? He went to the American yeah. Academy, but in the 50s. Yeah. And yeah. Um, he moved back to Chicago in the 80s, and that's when I got to meet him and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there were pockets. But the yeah. Western art market in the United States, so it's like a lot of Western cowboys, heritage, cowboys. American Indians, cowboys, yeah. Western landscape, 
that whole thing became very big in the 60s, 70s, and 80s because a lot of East Coast illustrators all moved yeah. out West to like Taos and Santa Fe and, and Colorado and all these places and created their own art groups and created these own kind of styles. And they, they were successful. But the rest of the country in general, real, I mean, there was a New York scene with like Dinnerstein and, you know, maybe David LaFell and, and a lot of artists like that, you know, who stayed in New York. There was a scene there. And Richard lived in New York for a while in the yeah. 60s and had a good um, career. Um, 70s and 80s were hard, but Western art, it started like the 90s. I don't know if it was just the economy but it just skyrocketed. I mean, there was just so many galleries popping up and so much. And selling, but the, selling re into realist paintings. Selling, but it wasn't, there weren't enough schools, yeah. you know, because people were always like, where do you go to school? So there was like the Art Students League and there maybe was a place in LA and then there was Chicago. There was like a school in Florida, you know, uh, Ringling. And there was a few schools here and there, but the... Ateliers, I think, started in 2000 and after, really, yeah. because all these artists came back from like Florence and came back from Europe. I mean, the thing is, Florence was set up by Americans. It's not they didn't learn from Italians. It's right. it, uh, those guys. Um, and they they. I can't remember. Is it Ga R H Gamel? I think it was their teacher who's a kind of sight size guy who's based in Boston. Hmm. I'm not that familiar. No. Yeah. I always, I had a thing, I had a theory that it might be because of American illustration, you know, like the Dean Cornwells and the, mm -hmm. and, the, and I think because of the advertising industry in America, maybe in the 1950s, that these illustration schools totally. were still retaining a lot well, of the kind of knowledge. Early, early illustration art. was incredibly yeah. fine yeah. art, like yeah, um, Andrew exactly. Wyeth, Bronwyn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah all these artists that were so painterly, you know, yeah. they were all yeah. in like the twenties and thirties. And so, but they were still almost like fine art. And then it, it got to be a little bit more advertising. Mm. Um, and then that's where all those illustrators that got into advertising illustration in the fifties, then they wanted to go back into like fine art. And that's when they all kind of blossomed and, mm. and exploded in the sixties and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think probably there's just a lot of money in the U.S. And, you know, so for me, for my experience, galleries have always been really big in the U.S., but they're always really big in tourism. So I grew up in Chicago. Galleries were not huge in Chicago. There, there would be like the abstract or like the kind of yeah, places more. that sold crappy stuff, too colorful, you know, didn't have anything to do with fine art, but they might have art galleries, but it was never the type of art that we would do. Um, you had to go to places like Aspen or Santa Fe or Jackson Hole, Wyoming, places, or like even Fredericksburg, Texas, places where people went on vacation. And mm -hmm. that's when people spent money. So that's where all the galleries popped up. So in the 80s, 90s, 2000s on, that's where the galleries are. I mean, there's galleries now in Los Angeles and New York. For a long time, there was great, and there still are, great galleries in Charleston, South Carolina. But these are destination places where people go, they have vacations, they stay for a week or two, and they are in the mood to spend money. And that's where all the um, artwork is really so, sold. Like, for instance, Scottsdale, Arizona, like Scottsdale, the art school. How old's that? Well, Scottsdale yeah. used to be huge. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was like the biggest art town probably in the country right. for like right. 20, 30 years. But it's not anymore. It is like um, the school there. So they used to have tons of galleries. Um, they would have openings every week. That's how many galleries they had. And it was a mecca. And the school helped because the school has been there. Gosh, I don't really know how long, but I know that Scott taught in Scottsdale in the 90s. So it's probably been there for like 40 years or more. So, and, it, and so it's a great place. I mean, I literally just taught there. Yeah. It's a great building. It's a great place to teach. It's a great place for students to go because 
there's so much that going on at the same time. So you can have four or five different workshops going on at the same time. So that means you get to like, you might've taken a workshop with one artist, but maybe during lunch or maybe afterwards, you can meet the other teachers and, and go around to the other classrooms and meet other students and see other artwork. And then there used to be art walks every Thursday and, there, and you'd be able to go to the galleries and see all of their openings. It's slowed down a lot, especially because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Scottsdale will resurge again. Who knows? Jackson Hole is humongous. Um, you know, so there's certain places around the country that are super big for galleries right now. So, and it morphs. It kind of like one city will be really big and then maybe that gallery, the owner will die or whatever. And then another gallery will open up and, you know, Santa Fe is still pretty big. You know, they still have galleries there. Mm. Um, we, we have something similar in the UK with um, content, with like figurative realism in the UK. So my experience, like when I went to art school, I was always, I, when I was a kid, I was always into drawing and I was drawing mm-hmm. at the time, but mainly comics and illustration. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't that exposed to fine art. Right. Um, and that's what yeah. I wanted to do. Most when people I went aren't, to, yeah. Yeah, when I wanted to, I mean, I, I do remember looking at old masters and stuff like that in art galleries, but again, it felt like it was, wasn't was humanly possible anymore. Totally. Do you know what I mean? And I agree. I, like, I, yeah. And no, I, I, I mean, how does Rembrandt do that? I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and when I went to art school, um, I wanted to base probably be an illustrator, but there was no drawing in training in drawing and painting and everything at that time in the UK in the 90s was all about it was like the YBAs have you heard of the YBAs you know Damien Hurst and Tracy Emin and kind of very contemporary I mean um, I've heard of Damien Hurst but I'm not familiar yeah Yeah. no no no, like totally uh conceptual all of that and I wasn't into any of that so I basically dropped out of art school but at the same time we had all our kind of conservative English kind of, uh, you know, um, mm-hmm. in, in parts of England, in the countryside and stuff like that, and in London, who were having portraits painted, buying like, you know, um, landscapes and all this kind of stuff, and probably quite a big market. But I was not aware of it. I didn't even know it existed. It was not. No. TV doesn't tell us. No, no. It was none of that's in the media. Do you know what I mean? And and there was no internet for me in the 90s. Totally. Yeah. I didn't know that. And again, you have these villages in Oxfordshire that are full of art galleries. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it sounds like Santa Fe, Burford in in, in Oswalds. There's very affluent parts of the country, sort of uh, up in Suffolk. and. And the towns are like full of galleries and these galleries, they will have a, a, a big gallery, like a, a UK gallery, like Thompson's or something like that. And they'll have mm. a branch in Mayfair and a branch in one of these towns. Right, right. Um, but the it was just like, I had didn't have a clue. We've also got, we've got the Mao galleries, which is probably the centre of realist painting in the mm. uk the mao galleries is in is in pal mao by buckingham palace and it's not it's mm. not it is a commercial game but it's basically the home of the federation of british artists and we have the royal society of portrait painters the new english arts club that was you know william orpen was a member they were set up in mm. victorian time again i didn't know these places existed yeah. when i was an art student do you know what i mean and, yeah. and it wasn't until like again in the early Two th- sort of early 2000s when when people started to have websites and i started that's to what's so great about, about your youtube channel yeah. i mean people i yeah like us who only had art magazines right yeah. we didn't have the internet there wasn't anything on tv we you know unless you traveled you could never see mm. art you know that much so nowadays oh my god instagram facebook youtube it is so much at our fingertips mm. that like the you know, the expansion of art ideas and the the amount of amazing artists has oh, like yes, quadrupled. I think Instagram's really blown it. Totally. Blown it it's it's a it is really yeah. a very, very interesting time. A much bigger world, exactly. It's totally. World. And I mean I, it, as I say, I think I was there right at the start of the internet, basically artists finding like sure. I found my teacher on the internet. 
and now more and more younger kids are, are basically getting you know sort of well you just who knows what it'll look like office, 20 years from now time. yeah yeah exactly um yeah it's interesting and i mean that's the thing we're kind of rediscovering this knowledge from i was thinking about this actually because we're talking videos is like even though we're trying to rediscover the knowledge of the artists of the past there's actually the the videos the demos and all of that is something that the artists in the past if you went if you say you were at Car carolus duran's studio yeah you know, i know you just learned from carolus duran do you know what i mean right um, you got an amazing education obviously but you were that was it but whereas we now can probably all can the you, top painters in the world you can watch them paint i know i can't even imagine what would it be like to be like 20 now and yeah. to be able to have everything at your fingertips I mean, wait, wait, if i this is why i do what i do this is why i started my I, youtube channel yeah. because if i had known you know at 18 when i went to art school and with the, which the experience i found really disillusioning um had i been introduced you know had i landed in the palette and chisel or somewhere like that do you know what i mean um yeah it would have you know i would have loved that but that that that's why i i, I did my youtube channel i think it's great it's for yeah kids. Well, yeah not necessarily kids but people um you know to just find find out about real painting again you know and the the mm -hmm. knowledge you know what i i don't want to say it, you know because i'm probably still if i for instance if i met someone like harold speed he'd probably think i was talking rubbish but um i don't <laughs> know but at least, at least hopefully i'm putting people on the right track um well i have about 15 minutes so what do you yeah. So in 15 minutes, I have to go. So, no, that's great. That's fantastic. I think I, I'm trying to think of anything else other than um, I don't know the lot. Okay, the one last question: If you've got any advice for speaking, we've been talking about young young artists uh, finding out or thinking to start painting or make a career. Have you got anything to impart? To well, I guess out? or not even young artists. People, yeah, anybody. I mean, out painting. It's, kind of like like we were just saying so much at your fingertips that oh i mean i don't want to be a debbie downer but i actually do kind of steer people away from going to art school you know yeah, yeah, i yeah. think i think that art school i think that going into debt for anything you know i just don't even know how it's just not worth it so there are so many videos and workshops and things that you can do. Now, so I also believe though that people grow and learn better in groups. I just do. Mm -hmm. I think that trying to do it by yourself is good, but finding any sort of like-minded people, and that's what we're talking about. It's like when we first moved down here, you know, it was slow, but you have to find people who have the same kind of, you know kind of likes and dislikes going to an art store or an art gallery and asking around are there any art groups you you have to go and have an open mind and you sort of like see what you like and see what you don't like but a lot of times you like when I first started and I talked about in my 20s how intimidated I was you know it was so difficult for me to spend money on things that I didn't think were worth it, right? So like hiring a model, I was always like, well, it's just not worth it because my painting's not gonna come out. So it was difficult for me to get all that practice and just doing it on my own. So I had to have other people go in on it. So just getting a few friends to go in on a model. If that's hard, then you find a few friends to paint each other. So, you know, what I've done too is like you get maybe three, four, five friends who all like to paint. You don't all have to be the same level, but you just like to do it. And you like to hang out and you have each one of you pose for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you do a tiny little head. So everyone does three or four little heads and want you pose at least once. You know, it's like figuring out a way to get practice in or doing little uh, still lifes. I think doing timed things is incredibly important because, you know, until you really know how to step up your work to the next level, you know, working on something for hours and hours and hours and hours doesn't always help. 
you need to get it down to like what's in the light and what's in the dark and just playing with simple little value studies, what's in the light and what's in the dark. Um, finding, so my biggest advice is spend the money that you would have spent on art school and buy art videos, do workshops if you can and see artwork in person and reach out to artists that you are really inspired by because you never know you, you know, if you really, you know, show interest and humble and willing to learn, you never know what will happen. You could maybe go visit them or paint with them or who knows, do one-on-one -on -one type of stuff. So just reach out to artists, you know, and so I guess, you know, that's kind of like my biggest advice is save your money and find people to share expenses with. <laughs> you know so <laughs> don't go to art schools your biggest that's that, i would agree completely about yeah. but certainly about mainstream art school yeah 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 i, I mean I, even i mean nowadays there are these ateliers and stuff but they do i mean they might give you good habits and good work ethic yeah. but they do tend to want you to paint just like them well whereas you sides. have a lot yeah i mean you sides. have to find a place that is willing to give you information, but not make you paint like them. Um, because it's incredibly difficult to make a living with atelier art. If yeah. you're gonna spend three months on something, there's just no way you could price it. I the, think that's, price that's, only, that's only one type of atelier though. That's one type of education mm -hmm. that seems to have overtaken right. the ateliers, this whole site. Yeah. Space drawing cast for yeah. I was lucky the place I went to wasn't like that the school my teacher set up oh that's great was he was totally against that and I was really lucky because I would have ended up at atelier being I call right. them I think what well, they are they're a bit like cults <laughs> I think they're a bit like cults I hope you keep that in <laughs> yeah, yeah no they do like the whole the thing was site size they only started because I've had a few yeah years. no and you know believe me Scott and I are extremely open about working from photos I mean yeah, it's yeah. like and it has been a crusade since the beginning even some of our close art friends you know who lie about working from photos yeah. and we know they do and it's like this whole god it's shaming people you yeah. know that you have to do art a certain way is just so insidious to me that I don't care if you stand I don't care if you sit yeah. I don't care if you work from a photo I don't care how you do it art is enjoyable and art is an expression I'm going to help you maybe ask some questions or figure out technical things or this or that but I don't care if you use your fingers I don't care if you use crayons it's like you you know when artists try and belittle people or make people like go in a certain path or like literally telling you that that's not real art or that's whatever. I yeah. mean, I've heard yeah. people say that because Zorn used photos, he's not a real artist. Like, like, I hope all of that information just disappears, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we all, I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm probably guilty of being dogmatic about some things, you know what I mean? And I think artists are, you know, we, maybe it's not, it's not just artists, it's, it's people, te technicians in general, I've found, mm -hmm. like, or, or start, sort of nerds. We tend to have, like, think we know best do you know what I mean so I think there's an element of that about about that in artists like oh no you've I got know. to do it this way and that way I know um yeah I probably I'm probably dogmatic about some things but you're you know you're completely right because who's to say it is subjective at the end of the day um anyway well on that oh no don't go to art school <laughs> <laughs> do patreon right take yeah, our yeah, patreon, yeah. patreon and watch videos and you'll find yeah. great stuff on youtube right? oh yeah <laughs> and reach out to artists and you know if i had an artist who wrote me and like yeah. you know started I, there was just and was just like really humble and just really excited about learning and wanted advice of course i would give it you yeah. know and yeah. it's it's just and so I think, yeah, there's ways had, of doing I've had great. I've had, I've, uh, I can think of a young artist who contacted me right at the beginning of my YouTube. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Like when I literally just started, I probably had about a thousand subscribers. And um, like, I, you know, she, you could tell she's quite talented. And I, I basically, she, she lived in another part of the UK up north. And I said, 
do you know what? You need to buy a la prima and you need to go to the courses. You, you're up near, she lives quite near to where Rosemary's brushes mm. are. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, you should go to do some courses there and you need to buy a la prima. And yeah. now she's absolutely smashing it. Oh, like great. she's winning prizes and stuff like that. And just, uh, I just remember, gosh, she contacted, I remember her contact. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> on, uh, it, I know. On, it's one like. One little shove in the right direction. Perfect. Then, yeah. 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 Well, so cool. yeah, you I think that's the way. That's the way for people to do it. It's just to get on with it, really, and paint. And basically, there is so much at your fingertips now. Yeah. That wasn't before. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Yay. For doing this um, interview. Um, all of these videos that we've mentioned, and um, I'm going to put links in the description to pa okay. Susan's website and Patreon channel, and you can find all of the videos that we've mentioned. And her partner Scott. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Well, guys, I hope you all enjoyed that interview, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.